Of course, we know that Marx wrote his books in, in Europe in the middle 1800s, uh, but you know, in Latin America and all over the world, these ideas take shape. And I think they take shape very, a very particular way to our conditions, uh, as you mentioned before, indigenous socialism. And I think in El Salvador is one of the first examples of, uh, of an indigenous uh, socialist uprising. En la búsqueda del tiempo en que florezca la tierra por los que han ido cayendo, en que venga la alegría a lavar el sufrimiento, en que venga la alegría a lavar el sufrimiento. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ramiro from Anticonquista. I'm one of the co editors of Anticonquista. Anticonquista is an anti-imperialist media collective. Our content is produced by and for the Latin American and Caribbean diaspora. And today we have the honor of being joined by Ron Goches. He's a high school teacher in South Central LA and a leading member of one of my favorite organizations out there that are actually serving the people in the community, Unión del Barrio. Ron, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So, Ron, today I'm hoping that we can talk about the history of socialism in El Salvador. Um, El Salvador is a country that unfortunately gets overlooked a lot in terms of politics and history, and especially revolutionary history. El Salvador has a population of about seven to eight million people in Central America, borders Guatemala and Honduras. And since the 18 and 1900s, there has been a strong tradition of revolutionary activism, indigenous socialism in El Salvador. And I'm hoping to go over some of that with Ron today because it's important we pass down this information. This is stuff you're not gonna find anywhere in textbooks, in history books, uh, on, even on YouTube. Unfortunately, a lot of the content is mainly in Spanish. And with so many Salvadoran youth on the front lines of the resistance against uh, police brutality, racism, imperialism, it's important that we connect with stuff going on in the past, with the past work of previous ancestors who were also fighting up against the same systems of oppression. And so today we're going to be focusing on the history of Salvadoran socialism. So, Ron, tell me about indigenous society in El Salvador. Obviously, Columbus came and terrorized and, and pillaged this continent in the 1400s. What was indigenous society like in El Salvador? Who were the native indigenous people of El Salvador? Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I want to say, you know, as a, me personally, um, Salvadoran and Mexican, um, but I think that my my uh, political side definitely comes more from the Salvadoran um, history. And so it's an honor for me to even get to speak about this today. So thank you again for the invitation. Uh, as you were saying, you know, the, the struggle for uh, our people for first for even just mere existence uh, because of Spanish colonization is, is an important struggle. And our people are still in struggle to this very day. So when we talk about indigenous struggles, uh, for those of you who don't, who don't know much about El Salvador, El Salvador uh, is a small country, uh, El Ombligo, in America Latina, it's right in the middle uh, of Central America. It's a small country geographically, but with a big history of struggle. Uh, the original peoples of, of El Salvador are, are Mayan people, uh, Nahuapipil, Lenca, different indigenous groups, uh, but in, in, in general terms, Mayan people. And you know, ever since um, the conquest of the Spanish uh, uh, in in the in the you know 15th century, 16th centuries, uh, our people have been in resistance ever since. And I think that that's a rich in history that all Salvadoran people uh, should be very proud of. You know, I think all people of, of Nuestra America should be very proud of. You know, it's like I'm very proud of other struggles around the world who fought against colonization and against imperialism. And, and I think that we as Salvadorans have a very particular uh, a pride in that because we've been fighting ever since and continue to fight today. You know, when we look into uh, the hundreds of years of struggle against colonialism, um, when we when we go all the way up until uh, the early 1900s, 
uh, you know, getting into the topic of socialism. Of course, we know that Marx wrote his books in, in Europe in the middle 1800s, uh, but you know, in Latin America and all over the world, these ideas take shape, and I think they take shape very, a very particular way to our conditions, uh, as you mentioned before, indigenous socialism. And I think in El Salvador is one of the first examples of uh, of an indigenous uh, socialist uprising. Um, you know, in the in the 1920s, of course, because of the Great Depression and, and the international uh, collapse of the economy, um, this, like everywhere else, hits very hard uh, in El Salvador. And the, the elite at that time uh, are scrambling uh, because they're, you know, in El Salvador, one of, the, one of our main crops has always been, export crops has been coffee. And uh, a lot of the, the workers, of course, were, were the peasants, the campesinos, mostly indigenous. And so when the people uh, start seeing uh, or feeling the pressure of the living conditions going down during uh, this time of economic depression, uh, you see the, the landlords, los terratenientes, uh, the elite really repressing the people, the indigenous people. So uh, throughout the 1920s and going into the early 1930s, you have uh, a population that is fed up with the living conditions, with the horrible living conditions in El Salvador. And so you, uh, you start seeing people organize themselves. Um, we have historic leaders that, you know, some of these names you may, you may have heard of them, you may have not. If you haven't, you know, I, I highly recommend that you research them. You know, some of the famous indigenous leaders, uh, Jose Feliciano Ama, we're talking about Anastasio Aquino. These are people who were organizing the, the peasantry, the peasants, the campesinos, um, the indigenous people, and they were organizing for rebellion, for full out insurrection. Uh, these, these compas, you know, were organizing with also intellectuals who were university educated uh, people, like of course, uh, the famed uh, person who later in the, in the 80s, the namesake of the Revolutionary Army in El Salvador, Farabundo Martí. Uh, Martí, you know, went to uh, the Universidad del Salvador, La Nacional, um, and other people like Miguel Marmol, they're gonna lead these struggles. Um, and I apologize for just saying basically only men's names, uh, but you know, as we know in, in history, a lot of the times, although the mujeres were, were central to the to the struggle, a lot of the names and the people at the forefront, um, you know, these names are men. Um, but um, these compas organized, and they were organizing for full insurrection in 1932, early 1932 in January, to be exact. And the idea was a full armed insurrection. Uh, you had a situation where the indigenous people, you know, are tired of having the boot to their neck uh, for for generations, for centuries. And, you know, that was on one hand, the situation where they wanted to take action immediately. You had some of the, the leaders like Farabundo Martí, who was uh, the founder of the Communist Party in El Salvador. Uh, they were saying, you know, hold on, hold on, let's, let's organize this a little bit more before we attack. Um, you know, unfortunately things didn't go well for that insurrection. Um, the, the, military, the military government uh, of that time, um, you know, found out, found out about the plans for this insurrection. Uh, the dictator, Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez, he is going to give orders in, into what, you know, notoriously became known later as La Matanza. Um, he is going to give orders to his military um, in very plain words uh, to kill anybody who looks like an Indian. OK, so in early in January of 1932, uh, an, you know, an unimaginable repression takes place in El Salvador. Uh, against the indigenous people in particular, something that has had an impact until this very day in El Salvador. While in neighboring countries of Guatemala and others, you still have a, a more heavy and pronounced indigenous presence. You know, we're talking about traditional clothing, the language, culture, etc. Today in El Salvador, that's barely reviving. And, and that's due to this, this horrible repression, state repression that happened in 1932, where you had in one week, you had um, you know, there's different estimates, but I think that the general term is around 30,000 people were, were massacred in 1932 in one week. That amounted to roughly about 4% of the entire Salvadoran population at that time. Okay, so that's that's clearly genocide. That's genocide against the indigenous people. And the, the repercussions of that of that genocide, like I said, are still felt to this very day. You know, after that matanza, the famous matanza or the massacre, um, not only did the government kill the, the indigenous people, they continued to try to kill the culture of indigenous people. And laws were passed that said that anything having to do with 
you know, indigenous culture, traditional clothing, the language, the music, the dances, anything having to do with indigenous culture was strictly prohibited. And, you know, at the same time, because people were fighting for their survival, indigenous people in El Salvador were forced to basically deny their uh, indigeneity. They were forced to say, you know, no somos indios, you know, we're, we're campesinos. And, and that for generations took place. So, you know, today, a very small amount of people in, in our country, El Salvador, still practice their indigenous ways. A very small amount of people uh, speak Nahuatl, uh, indigenous languages. Um, and so it's, it's really painful to know what happened to our people. But I do want to say that today there is very much a movement um, of people in El Salvador who are trying to uh, rescue uh, our culture, right, to bring back uh, our language, our tradition, our history. So I, I definitely want to say that because it's important that we recognize that. But, you know, the areas uh, in El Salvador today, like Nahuizalco, uh, that still have, you know, indigenous uh, presence and culture thriving, um, those are areas that we have to see and, and, and be able to support so that our culture can continue uh, to come back. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, you know, I would say the majority of the people in El Salvador today are still indigenous or part indigenous for sure. But, you know, today a lot of our people don't recognize ourselves as such. We call ourselves campesinos or, you know, uh, morenos or, or, you know, anything but indigenous. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a direct consequence of La Matanza, the massacre of 1932. Uh, but although, you know, all of those comrades, most of them were executed for their participation in the planning of an, an insurrection, uh, they planted the seeds of revolution in our people that, you know, later on are going to grow and are continuing to grow to this day. And I think that the, the fact that we're talking about this today is, is a testament that although they tried to, you know, wipe out uh, our people in El Salvador, they have not been able to. And that, that history continues today and the struggle continues today. I'm glad you mentioned La Matanza. And I think it's one of the central moments in Salvadoran history where a revolutionary upsurge was born. Before we get into the 20th century, I just wanted to quickly ask you about the Central American Federation. Uh, my family's from Honduras, and if you look at the Honduran flag, there's five stars on it, and uh, each star represents the five countries of the Central American Federation that was organized by Manuel Jose Arce, who was born in uh, what is now today El Salvador, and Francisco Morazan, who is uh, from Honduras, or what is now today Honduras. And their vision for a Central American Federation was a threat to U.S. imperialism, was a uh, at, which was growing at the time as a uh, geographic area that's locked between South America and North America. Uh, Central America and Francisco Morazan and Manuel Jose Arce always uh, wrote about this is that Central America could be one of the main uh, naval powers in the Americas because of its access to both oceans, uh, because of its center position. And so during the 1800s, you had a conscious attempt by uh, the right wing in the U.S., especially in the Confederacy, which existed at the time, people like William Walker uh, from from uh, Tennessee, who wanted to balkanize Central America and create them as basically slave plantations. The British also carved out pieces in Central America like Belize and the Mosquito Coast in Nicaragua. So why is it that Central, why is it that you think uh, Central America w was fragmented. You know, why was it balkanized? Because I think me personally, I think if, if we were to talk about socialism and, and this ties in with what we'll talk about later uh, when we talk about the FMLN uh, presidencies, I think socialism in Central America would work so much better if we were able to come together as Central American people and, and even bring about some sort of socialist federation um, building on what people built before. I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, Francisco Morazan is one of the, the great uh, thinkers uh, and leaders in the history of our continent that really doesn't get the recognition that, that he deserves. Interestingly enough, I was in uh, New Orleans a couple of years ago and I, I see a statue. I'm like, wait, that kind of looks like. And then I walk up to the statue and sure enough, Morazan. And I was like, in New Orleans? That was that was a trip to me. Um, but yeah, we see that the Confederation, Central American Confederation, um, is is something that you know we should learn from today. And you know, for those of you who know a little bit of the history of it, is that you know after the independence movement from Spain, uh, Mexico and Central America become liberated from Spain at the same time in 1821, and the region what is today Central America 
at the time, well, you can say under the under the control of, of that time of the Mexican government. But this region is going to want to be break away. And people like uh, and Morazan and others are going to basically say that a united Central America is going to be much stronger. So we agree in that today. I think these are these are visions that, you know, around the same time of Bolivar, who was calling for a united Latin America. And later on, of course, Che is going to make the same call. So I think that the, the history that we learn here is that united, uh, we are much stronger than we are divided. And I think that the United States, you know, uh, is going to understand that. And so later on, when the attacks come in, in our region, you know, uh, when they go after Panama, when they take over Nicaragua, uh, you know, Sandino makes the same call, you know, the fight against the Yankee. And I think that uh, the leaders of that time period, uh, we, we still have a lot to learn from them today. And I think that the, the differences that we see uh, today in Central America politically are no, are no coincidence. We know that the U.S. Uh, involvement, U.S. intervention, and the U.S. indoctrination in the region has a lot to do with why we are so divided and why today we don't have something like a Central American Federation, uh, unfortunately, because if we did, we would be uh, a lot stronger. I think the only things that we've had historically uh, similar to that since then has been in revolutionary uh, political spaces like uh, the FMLN and the FSLN in Nicaragua, for example, who are working together. But today, I think we have a long way to go we, before we can get back to that point uh, where the leaders of these different Central American countries are working together um, for the, the betterment um, of our people. You know, there's unfortunately the right wingers do work together in Latin America and they do unify their struggles. Now, the left, uh, it's time that we continue to do the same and learn from our ancestors because they had those visions a long time ago and they were right. History has proven that they were right. Yeah, definitely. And one of those ancestors, one of my personal inspirations, Faraundo Marti, I mean, this guy had such a, a cool life and he was one of the people who was developing uh, a Latin American and indigenous form of, of socialism way before a lot of these uh, academics and theorists that we see today. And I know in 1925, uh, Marti was appointed as a representative to go to a conference of the Anti-Imperialist League of the Americas in New York City. Uh, and he actually got arrested in New York. I'm from New York, born and raised. So when I found out about that, I was like, wow, like that's crazy. He was in my hometown and he was a revolutionary uh, Salvadoran communist organizing. And I'm curious to know who he met in New York at that time. And I know also in the 20s, um, as you mentioned, he was working with Augusto Cesar Sandino in Nicaragua who was also leading a, a people's uprising in Nicaragua against the, the Somoza dynasty. Tell me a little bit about Martí. What was his vision? What was his activism? And what differences would you say he had with Sandino? Because I know there was also some minor um, political divisions at the time. Yeah, um, I think that what, well, I think what unified them was a lot stronger than their differences. But, you know, they, they both believed in the need for revolution. They both were, uh, you know, uh, to the bone uh, comunistas. You know, they both uh, helped each other work in conjunction. They both were in Mexico um, because of the repression in their own countries. So I think that those are the things that unite them. And I think that even to today, obviously, those, those are the, probably the two biggest names in Central American revolutionary history. Um, you know, you mentioned New York. It's interesting. New York has always has a connection to everything, it seems like. You know, at the same time, you have uh, Marcus Garvey and the movement for, you know, the black nationalist movement at the time there. Uh, a little later, you're going to have even Ho Chi Minh uh, living in New York. Um, so anyway, I just thought that I would throw that in. But um, going back to Marti, Marti, you know, was a so-called educated person. You know, he went to college and all that. Uh, so he, he, he knew theory. He was a Marxist-Leninist. And I think that's important for people who may not know that. You know, you have to understand that's pretty significant, being that the Soviet Union had barely been formed. So this idea of international communism and the, the international uh, of Lenin was pretty new. And they were, uh, there weren't that many people in the entire continent who were already uh, not just knew about uh, socialism and communism, but actually were organizing and leading a, 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 a revolution with that kind of analysis. You know, we know that uh, uh, Martí and uh, Sandino are both going to be in Mexico even during the time of the Mexican Revolution at the very end. Um, but of course, the differences in, in, in these Central American countries and with these uh, leaders like 
Farabundo in particular, is the class-based analysis, right? The revolutionary uh, Marxist-Leninist analysis as a solution to the contradictions facing uh, the people of his country. I think that's what's important about uh, Marti. And, you know, as a Salvadoran, I'm proud that we had someone that early on in the game already educating the masses uh, about the need for a scientific-led revolution that had uh, Marxism-Leninism as, as a science to organize the workers to be able to overthrow, uh, you know, the government. Um, that's a little bit about the, the, the theoretical, uh, you know, Marti. And then, of course, uh, the, the fighter. Um, they, were, they were getting ready for insurrection. They weren't just intellectuals talking about, you know, um, theory. They were about fighting for liberation, and they knew that there was no other way. And so, you know, with the support of people like Sandino, uh, with some support uh, from uh, from other surrounding countries, they were able to um, lead a movement that was such a threat that it caused, at least in El Salvador, uh, the massive amount of repression that that took place. And that's unfortunate, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that it it was a failed um, a failed vision. It doesn't mean that his ideology was wrong. Um, it's just that you know, in revolution, as as uh, Che said later, if it's real, it's either you win or you die. And at that time they didn't win, but the struggle wasn't over there. That was just the beginning for the, in terms of socialist uh, revolution in El Salvador. So we talked about La Matanza in 1932, uh, horrible acts, uh, horrible massacre where between, I think it was probably more than 40,000, but the official estimates are like 10,000 to 40,000, but countless indigenous people were, were murdered and, and slaughtered by Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez. And into the 40s and 50s, the repression continued. What happened in the 70s where things really changed? Because, for example, in 1979, I know there was a coup um, against a president named Carlos Humberto Romero. And from there, there was the imposition of the military junta, a uh, government. So what, what were the conditions leading up to that where we see this resurgence of a socialist activity in El Salvador? Yeah. Even before we get to the 60s, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, for some of you watching may be wondering, so whatever happened to the president who led the, the, the Matanza? Well, he stayed in power as a dictator for several years. But it's also, it's also important to say that the Salvadoran people, I think, redeemed themselves in a way by continuing the struggle. And uh, the students, the workers, the campesinos all led a general strike. And, and in 1944, that's what finally forced um, the dictator to, to, leave, to leave power. So uh, again, another example through history of a general strike uh, leading that. And you better believe that it was, you know, comunistas who were pushing the line for that type of, uh, of action. So we, we did topple um, Martinez in that, um, in, in, from power. Going from there, the conditions are actually going to worsen. In El Salvador, uh, really what's now known as the 14 families. Uh, 14 families pretty much control everything socially, politically, economically in the country. They had all the wealth in the country and the conditions for the, the, the campesinos, the peasantry, uh, you know, worsened. And so and by the 60s and definitely by the 70s, um, you know, you're going to have in El Salvador uh, the formations of armed groups, armed revolutionary groups. That shouldn't be a surprise. Of course, we saw in that time period, you know, uh, in the early 60s, you see the, the triumph of the Cuban revolution. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, you see the heroic and triumphant struggle of the Vietnamese people, uh, you know, in their fight against French colonialism and then against U.S., uh, you know, um, uh, the attempt of the U.S. to take over that country. So armed struggle at that time is, is, is ripe all over Latin America, in Guatemala, in Colombia. There's revolutionary activity happening. So it's natural that in El Salvador you're going to have that as well. Um, so you're gonna have a situation where there's different organizations, student groups, um, revolutionary groups throughout the country who see no other solution than to take up arms because in the late, uh, I think it was late, yeah, late 1970s, you're gonna have uh, actually some of the communist um, candidates for, for office win, but the, the government at the time uh, would not allow them to take power, right? To take office, I should say. So. At the, at the obvious, um, you know, it's obvious it was a farce, that elections were a farce, that they, they didn't, they weren't legitimate. The people saw no other way. And in the 60s and 70s, 
uh, in the 70s uh, in the, on a personal level. This is when my mom, late 1970s, my mom leaves in Salvador. Uh, she tells me that she saw people decapitated on the side of the road, you know, that type of repression to really terrorize the community so that they wouldn't dare join uh, revolutionary movements. But there was no stopping it because the repression was so bad that the people had to organize and armed struggle at that time was seen as the only way. Um, so in by the late 1970s, you have many different revolutionary groups, but you're definitely going to have five that are going to stand out. So this is where you, uh, I guess people, I'm a teacher, man. So you got to, you got to take notes. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. I got my notebook out. It's all good. <laughs> There you go. So the uh, the five forces who are going to the five main organizations uh, who are really pushing the way for revolution, they come from different tendencies. Some of them are straight up Marxist, Leninist, you know, hardcore communist, uh, like a Soviet line. And then you had other groups who really come from the religious, uh, the religious community. And I know that may sound uh, kind of religious, but yeah, a lot of the original groups were they come from like the Orthodox Church, from the different church groups who they saw that they could no longer just, uh, it reminds me of the song by Los Guaraguao, uh, No Basta Rezar. And it, they just saw that religion is, is good and all, like, you know, that was a religious belief, but they had to fight. And I think that, you know, in Central America, um, one of the one of the uh, the, uh, the ideas that becomes really, really important uh, is is the, re the, the relationship with the Catholic Church. Um, where a lot of the, the movements in the Catholic Church end up supporting the revolutionary movements. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the five forces in, in El Salvador that eventually unite, that create uh, a revolutionary army, are going to be Las Fuerzas Populares de Liberación, uh, Farbundo Martí, or the FPL. Okay, these are the forces led by Cayetano Carpio. Uh, these are, this is the first uh, guerrilla group and the biggest guerrilla group at the time. Um, you're also going to have La Resistencia Nacional, uh, El Partido Comunista Salvadoreño, El Partido Revolucionario de los Trabajadores Centroamericanos, um, and uh, the RRP, El Ejército Revolucionario del Pueblo. So there's five different groups, and that always trips me out because, you know, we live here in such a big, big, monstrous country, and we can't even get one serious organization, man. <laughs> and these comrades in a tiny little country like El Salvador had five, you know, serious uh, guerrilla organizations at the time. And, you know, one of the things that I think definitely we can learn from today um, is from, I mean, today in the struggle that we participate in is uh, that we have to unite. And these compas, even though they have some serious differences, and even after they united, they had some serious differences, um, they realized that they had to unite. And that's the only way they were going to be strong enough to launch uh, an offensive against the government that actually had a chance of, of, of winning the revolution. So, um, you know, who were they, who were they going up against? I think that that's also important to talk about, um, you know, in the, in the late 1970s, as you mentioned, there was, uh, there were different golpes, uh, coups, coup d'etats. And, uh, and in Salvador, it's like all these military, uh, folks basically jumping over each other to be in power. And this is going to really, um, become cemented in a new political party uh, that is born at this time period um, called ARENA, now today known as ARENA. And that's the Alianza Republicana Nacionalista. And the Nacionalista part is important because these aren't nacionalistas like proud patriots of their country, like for the betterment of the country. Nacionalista comes from like the fascist uh, term nationalist, the fascist type of nationalist, where these people were they were openly fascist. And their founder, Roberto Dawison, uh, who was trained at the School of the Americas, who was funded by the United States government, was as right wing as they come. And uh, he started this party. And he was also one of the leaders of the death squads in El Salvador, who during the time of the war is going to massacre thousands and th tens of thousands of people. So these are the people who, who we had to contend with at the time uh, as, as a Salvadoran left. And like, as I mentioned, of course, the United States government, who by the early 1980s, you're going to elect Ronald Reagan. Uh, I guess you can say that kind of the Trump of the time, uh, you know, the celebrity term president. Ronald Reagan was a hard right winger who was, you know, extremely anti-communist. And he was very, very public that he said he would stop communism in Central America. 
and anywhere else in the world. And so, um, you know, these forces that eventually became known as, when they all united together, as the Frente Farabundo Martí de Liberación Nacional, the FMLN, uh, these, this revolutionary army was going to have to face not only the army of El Salvador, but the unlimited resources that they were being given by the United States government. Um, and not even just the United States government. I think that's important that we, we say that because I think oftentimes when we talk about the civil war in El Salvador, everyone knows that the U.S. government supported, but there's also other governments that clearly supported the Salvadoran military to repress the Salvadoran revolution. Uh, those governments are like neighboring Guatemala, who of course had a right-wing dictatorship government as well. You have Argentina, who had a dictatorship as well. You had Israel. Uh, Israel plays a huge role in the anti-revolutionary movement throughout the Americas. Um, and even Taiwan uh, is going gonna, is gonna to have uh, land resources to the uh, military of, of El Salvador. So, you know, to me, this is a point where as someone who was born right uh, pretty much a little too late to be part of all this, um, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a real... Uh, sense of pride, man, because the the FMLN, uh, by all indicators, at at no point did they ever have more than fifteen thousand combatants. Now that sounds like a lot to me, right? Because we don't have any organization today here in yeah. the United States that's even half that strong. But to have fifteen thousand combatants in the FMLN, and on the other side, the military of El Salvador, and when you combine the official state military and the death squads the mercenaries and then the U.S. soldiers who went to go, you know, train them over there, they always had a minimum of 75 to 80,000 uh, troops. So when you have, you know, at, at its peak, 15,000 versus 80,000, and history now, we know that the uh, Salvadoran government and in, in fact, the U.S. government publicly stated that they, they knew that the FMLN was militarily uh, invincible. Those are their words, invincible. So they knew that they were not going to be able to defeat the Salvadoran people um, and, and, and at least in an armed way. So they had to, you know, uh, revert to other other methods of, um, you know, of, of co-opting. And I mean, that's I guess that's a that's a different discussion. But I don't know. Um, you know, I'm sorry. One of the major, major things that I, I didn't um, that I didn't mention, I jumped right into the revolution and the war. But um, one of the, you know, one of probably one of the most famous uh, individuals that we know of today from El Salvador is uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero. And um, some of you may have heard that na that name, Oscar Romero or Monsignor Romero. Uh, Monsignor Romero becomes a popular voice in El Salvador in the late 1970s, early 80s, where he is um, openly calling uh, on the military to not repress the people. He openly, he actually gives the order. He says he orders the military in the name of God to stop the killing. And, um, you know, he, he became a very popular voice because he sided with the poor. He was very clearly with the poor. And uh, because of that, um, I think it showed the degree of of um, the degree of how reactionary the, the government and the military was that uh, Monsignor Romero, while giving mass uh, in the middle of San Salvador, you know, at, at a church, uh, he was executed. He was uh, he was killed by the bullets of snipers. And um, later on, of course, we find out that these people who led this attack um, are all trained at the School of the Americas, which is a military school at Fort Benning, Georgia, ran by the U.S. Army. Um, you know, when they killed Monsignor Romero, uh, that really was you know, the, uh, the last, uh, the stray that broke the, what do you call it? The straw that broke the camel's back, as they say, uh, there was already in a uh, super high tension in El Salvador, the people, the masses wanted revolution. And when they killed, uh, the beloved Monsignor Romero, this, this was the moment where a lot of people took to the streets. And when they took to the streets, especially at the Catedral in, in, uh, in San Salvador in the capital of El Salvador, um, at the um, at the the services for Monsignor Romero is where the military showed up and opened fire on complete civilians who were unarmed, 
uh, men, women, children, elders, you know, hundreds of people were massacred there, literally on the steps of the cathedral in San Salvador. And like I said, this was a moment where uh, it was a point of no return. And the masses knew that armed struggle was the only way. So uh, in, in early, uh, well, in, in 1980, in October of 1980, the FMLN officially uh, joins those five organizations unite, the revolutionary organizations unite and form the FMLN and the official civil war begins. So that is um, an, an extremely important moment in our history. Uh, that was the only way that uh, some things uh, were changed in El Salvador. For example, like the National Guard or La Guardia Nacional, who was a, basically a terrorist organization in El Salvador who massacred people, repressed people, uh, jailed people, disappeared people. Um, you know, that the only way that they were able to get rid of them was through the war. Uh, the war lasted um, 12 years and went from 1980 until the peace accords in 1992, on January 16th, I believe, uh, 1992, where, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, between 80 to 100,000 Salvadorenos died, the majority of them being civilians, non-combatants, uh, the majority of them being definitely killed by the armed forces of El Salvador. Um, you know, that's it's a painful history. It's a painful moment in our country. Um, but I think it's a moment that as Salvadorans, we have a lot to learn from it. And I think the entire world can learn a lot from uh, that experience, um, you know, good and bad of, of in this fight for revolution, we can learn a lot from the experience in Salvador. That's definitely well said. And I know into the mid to late 1980s, at some point, the FMLN was able to control vast areas of the country. And the Reagan administration was basically shitting its pants because not only was the uh, the FMLN really successful in, in El Salvador, but they also had a lot of support in the diaspora. Uh, in New York, for example, my uh, I grew up in New York in Queens. In Long Island, there's a big Salvadoran community uh, in Hempstead. And I know during the 80s, there was a lot of Salvadorans who were organizing and uh, people in the diaspora abroad. I'm sure they're very similar here in LA. Um, in the I, Talking about the 80s, I wanted to ask you, uh, what exactly was the turning point? Because I know uh, by 1990, there were the peace talks. Um, obviously, there, that was simultaneous with the collapse of the Soviet Union. What happened where you know, you had all this energy building up, building up, building up, where it seemed inevitable that that the FMLN would would uh, would take over and, and and liberate El Salvador. Uh, what happened, and, and what were the what was the historical context of that period that 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 made that transformation? Okay, yeah, I think that's a really important question. Um, you know, talking a little bit about a little bit more about the war. I think one of the things I wanted to definitely mention. I think it's important, and I think that El Salvador. Uh, this is one of the things that I'm really proud about the, the revolutionary movement for socialism and for revolution in Salvador um, was the role that Mujeres played. Um, you know, we have the example, of course, of Cuba, uh, where Mujeres play a critical role in the revolution. And in El Salvador, it is, is the same. Um, you know, it, it's, it's believed that by the end of the war, about 30 percent of the combatants are going to be Mujeres. And that's a significant amount of fighters. So, uh, you know, the mujeres did play the role of, of nurses, of, of, of different roles like that, but of combatants was about 30 percent. And that is I think that's something that's very significant. And, you know, as as a, as a man, I'm proud to say that our comrades in El Salvador recognize the role of mujeres and, and that they had to be shoulder to shoulder in the trenches fighting for the liberation of our people in our country. Um, so I think that's something really important to say. And I think that there's some really uh, like legendary uh, revolutionary women uh, like Ana Maria, who are, uh, you know, if you don't know too much about her, it's, it's important that we research, that we learn about these mujeres who who pay the ultimate price, you know, who, who died in the revolution, but who I think are, are, are shining examples of revolutionaries, not just because they're women, just period, of revolutionaries. Um, I definitely wanted to say that um, before I moved on. But because of the international support as well, I think that's really important. Um, in the state in El Salvador, not the state, sorry, the Departamento in El Salvador today, named after Morazan, it's called Morazan. Uh, there's a tiny little museum um, that I hope, if you're watching this one day, you'll get to go to. It's in a place called Perkin in Morazan. It's a tiny little museum, and that was like the stronghold of the guerrilla. It's in the far 
uh, eastern part of El Salvador, bordering with Honduras. Um, and there, it's the Museum of the Revolution. And um, you, you'll be able to see, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff about the revolution, the artifacts, you know, they tell you a lot. All of the tour guides are ex-combatants, so they all were veterans of the war. And, and it's beautiful to see that. So if you can go there one day, I hope that you do. But the reason why I bring that up is because one of the rooms that they have in the museum is specifically talks about the solidarity, international solidarity. And solidarity came, a lot of people know that we got a lot of support from Cuba and definitely from Nicaragua. But there was also support from people and comrades all over the world, from Mexico to Germany to, like, I mean, all over the world. And they have posters up from Vietnam, from different places of, of people who provided any type of support for the revolution in the Salvador. And again, I think that that's uh, something that we can learn from today when we talk about international solidarity, because today, although today armed struggle isn't, I don't think it's seen as like the, the primary way of struggle today, we have to remember that there is still armed struggle today. And I, I think places like specifically in the Philippines, where the comrades there are engaged in serious struggle for national liberation. And I think for those of us who are from anywhere else in the world, uh, we should support the struggle of the comrades in the Philippines and in other places, like in Colombia and others, where they're still engaged in struggle. Um, so I wanted to say that about solidarity. But because of that strength of the Salvadoran people and the willingness to fight and because of the support of international solidarity, I know some comrades here from Los Angeles who lived here in L.A. already, who joined the struggle and went back to El Salvador and joined the and joined the war? You know, I know that something like I think uh, I'm not, I don't know if it was 200 or 300 Mexicans died fighting for the FMLN in El Salvador. So they were part of different Mexican communist groups who went to struggle. So the solidarity was strong. And by 1989 is that turning point that you're talking about. Uh, the comrades launched a strategic offensive called La Ofensiva Final, the final offensive. And the idea was, was to really maximize the forces and to launch a, a massive attack on the capital. Um, you know, for the most part, the war had been fought in the countryside and La Montaña, right? Because that's where, you know, typical guerrilla warfare, you can hide in the mountains. But in 89, the, the comrades made the decision that, you know, we got to go for the knockout blow. Um, and so La Ofensiva Final in 1989 is going to be an attack on San Salvador. And they, they surround San Salvador, they attack. They take over much of the, the capital. And at that point, when the comrades were able to do that, it's very clear that they are not only in the mountains, they're definitely in the cities as well. And it was something that the United States at that point, um, you know, their advisors in El Salvador, like the advisors in Vietnam, uh, they advised them that, you know, they advised the military that it was uh, militarily impossible to defeat the FMLN. So that's when the uh, the concept of the, the peace talks comes into effect. Uh, both sides knew that they were probably not going to win. Um, you know, I, I've spoken to the comrades who were in those in those battles who now live in L.A. And they tell me like they they were thinking they were preparing uh, themselves mentally to fight, you know, U.S. Marines because they they understood that in other parts of the world, like Vietnam, like Korea, like others, they were expecting a U.S. invasion. And they weren't going to back down from that. They were mentally and physically preparing themselves for that. And so in 89, when both sides realized that, for one, the FMLN was going to have to either continue to fight and possibly fight U.S. forces, or on the other side, for the military of El Salvador to see that the FMLN was not getting any weaker. And by that point, even though they had already lost thousands of, of men and women uh, in combat, the FMLN was still growing in number and uh, they were not going to be defeated. So it was kind of a situation of a, of a stalemate and the uh, both sides didn't, they couldn't see a military victory. Um, and to be honest, the Salvadoran people after 12 years of war has suffered tremendously. It's a small country geogra uh, geographically. So the pain was deep. Um, I don't think there's any Salvadorans that don't have at least one member of the family who wasn't either involved actively in the combat or that passed, you know, because of the war. So this is something that definitely was, you know, was bleeding the nation. And so, um, you know, after 89 and this attack, um, although the attack, the, the aim of it was to deliver the final blow, unfortunately that didn't happen. Um, but I think we have to say now in hindsight, and obviously at the moment, the comrades know, and this should be very clear for history, if it wasn't for the U.S. involvement, if it wasn't for the U.S. financing of the war in El Salvador, El Salvador would be 
it would have become another liberated uh, nation in our continent, uh, in our hemisphere, like Cuba, like Nicaragua. There's absolutely no doubt that El Salvador would have been another liberated country. And if that would have happened, that of course would have had repercussions on the on, on the region, right? Uh, El Salvador could have been able to help out more in, in the Guatemala uh, struggle for liberation and the social movements in Honduras and so on and so forth. So, you know, I think our region would be different today if it hadn't been for the U.S. In intervention and involvement in El Salvador. And that's really significant to say. Um, so going to the peace accords, uh, the peace accords were, were handled in Mexico, in, in Mexico City. And, you know, both sides, uh, this is something that's going to be studied for a long time. And I think other comrades that are in current negotiations, like in the, like the, the Compas from Colombia and even the Philippines, they study the Salvadoran peace accords uh, for what, you know, the left did right and what the mistakes that were made. And so, you know, by the end of the peace accords in 92, um, a lot of the status quo, you can say, stayed. You know, the people who were in power before stayed in power. Um, the FMLN went from being a, a guerrilla army uh, to being a, uh, a political party who engaged in electoral struggle and who disarmed at the end of 92. Um, so from 92 uh, up until today, the FMLN continues to be uh, a political force in the country, but it, it's an electoral party. It's no longer an armed uh, revolutionary army. So, you know, the struggle for socialism from there, uh, when they participate in national elections for the presidency, they, they lose the first few elections. And it's not going to be all the way up until 2009, where uh, it's a historic victory, because for the first time, the FMLN takes over state power in El Salvador. However, now, you know, uh, years after, there's definitely a lot to be learned there as well, where the FMLN uh, chose a candidate who was never a militant of the FMLN. Uh, they chose a candidate who obviously wasn't part of the war, uh, but was a candidate who was pretty much very popular. Um, it was uh, Mauricio Funes, who was uh, a reporter for CNN, who did who was at the war because he was covering the war for CNN, but obviously wasn't participating in the role of a revolutionary. And so his popularity um, you know, was used to try to, you know, defeat Arena. Um, and for the first time in 2009, that was accomplished. And uh, Mauricio Funes becomes president. Um, you know, I, I myself, uh, members from my organization, we went to El Salvador and we were participating in the struggle. We participated in supporting how we, however we could as international observers and things of that nature. Um, and, you know, it was a powerful moment because the FMLN had finally taken power. You know, what happened since then, uh, we can talk many, many hours about that and not all of it is pretty. Um, but, you know, I don't know what else, where else you want me to go with this. It's funny you mentioned uh, Mauricio Funes. People always ask me because my last name is Funes as well, but with the Z. And people are always like, yo, are you related to him? I'm like, yo, maybe somebody from El Salvador migrated to Honduras and uh, and started, you know, my dad's family. So it's possible. But yeah, I, um, I remember when he was elected because... 2009, you know, in Honduras, there was the coup against Manuel Zelaya. Uh, that was happening. That was the height of the, the pink tide in Latin America. Hugo Chavez was really uh, strong and fiery at that time before he unfortunately got sick and, and passed away. Um, 2009 was a, a really interesting year. And I remember when Mauricio Funes won uh, in Queens in, in Jamaica, where I used to live at. Uh, there's a lot of Salvis as well. And um, people were excited, like people were out in the streets, like waving flags. And there was a lot of hope for Mauricio Funes when he became president. Uh, and then a few years after that, you know, we didn't really see too much change um, and then in 2014, Salvador Sanchez Seren, who is uh, an OG of the struggle, he was an actual combatant and, and a leader. Um, and, and I think some of the things that he did was were obviously were a little better than Mauricio Funes. But I think also um, he was restricted by what uh, he was able to do. I'm sure there was probably more um, that he may have wanted to do. And so that ties in with a question that a lot of people, uh, not just with El Salvador, but the, the global south in general, is that, you know, you have 
people in in places like the U.S. or Europe who don't um, understand the tremendous amount of constraints and limits that uh, leftists and socialists in the global south have to work with, especially when you're talking about a country like El Salvador that had, as you mentioned, literally had, what, 12, 13 years of of bloody armed struggle that that devastated, wiped out like so much of the population. You have to rebuild your economy. What is your view of the the challenges that El Salvador faced um, uh, after the civil war, and and how do you think that connects with why Mauricio Funes and Salvador Sanchez Seren uh, probably weren't able to to move the country in a direction that that many people hope for? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, you know there were differences in the groups who united in uh, 1980 to form the FMLN, and those differences really remained throughout the 12 years of war. And even after the war, several groups, once the FMLN became a political party, some of the groups broke away because they didn't agree with the, you know, with the different tendencies. I think the historical lesson that we can learn uh, in Salvador and in many other places um, is that you, you call it the, the pink tide, you know? Um, there's different, you know, there's different tendencies in socialism. Um, and I think that the lesson learned here and throughout our continent is when we fight for socialism, when we fight for revolution, when we struggle for these things, I think we should be true to them. And I think that, um, you know, the case in El Salvador with some of the people that came to power, um, I'm not talking about just Mauricio Funes, but I'm talking about even like within the party structure, um, you know, they deviated from what the comrades in the mountains were fighting for. You know, the compas weren't fighting to be petty bourgeois. The compas were fighting for a Marxist Leninist revolution. They believed in a new society. They believed in, in, in revolution, you know? And I think that, uh, you know, some of the leadership of the FMLN, including the current leadership of the party, unfortunately, uh, you know, and I've met some of these, some of these folks and, um, you know, they're not Marxist Leninist revolutionaries, you know, they, uh, they're fighting for something different. And I think that if we're going to fight for socialism, let's stick with socialism and let's hold our leaders accountable so that we fight in that direction. You know, you know, of course, some people are going to say, well, if we're too, if we're too much hardliners, then, you know, the masses aren't going to support us. And there's that, there's that struggle, right? Like how hard of a line do we take or how soft do we go to win elections? You know, and I think that uh, El Salvador is an example of that, you know, in the last elections, uh, or yeah, the, the, the previous elections, you know, the FMLN uh, in the in the struggle for the presidency, they only got 14 percent of the vote, and that shows that the people have are not happy, you know, because I think the FMLN of today uh, at the leadership level is not what the FMLN in the mountains in the 80s represented, you know. Um, with that being said, though, I, I don't want to discard the comrades, the, two, the true comrades who still in El Salvador uh, are fighting for true socialism. The comrades who are still members of the FMLN, who are still activists and militants of the party, who really do have conviction to the ideals of the comrades, uh, of the fallen martyrs of the struggle. You know, I, I think that should be said. But, you know, um, what's happened is that, you know, some of these compas uh, put the, the chances of winning uh, a national election before the uh, before real socialism. You know, they put those interests first. And I think that's a, a history lesson that's that's painful, you know, uh, being that I had family who died in that war, being that, you know, I think, like I said, most Salvadorans had family die in that war. Uh, we know that's not what was happening now is not what our comrades and our family members died for. And I think that is going to be up to the new generation, the young people who are going to continue to struggle, who continue to struggle in El Salvador today uh, to lead the way. Because some of these uh, compas who, who are, who are in, in the leadership of the party, they don't represent uh, the true revolutionary line of the history of the FMLN and the history of a revolution in El Salvador. So today, I think there's a, there's um, really... Um, strong social movements in El Salvador. I think, again, a lot of the times led by the mujeres. Uh, the mujeres were fighting for the reproductive rights. Uh, the mujeres were fighting these struggles, leading most of these struggles. I think they're the inspiration that a lot of us see. 
you know, the, the LGBT community who's fighting for their rights. Um, and in El Salvador, you have extreme levels, like many other places, of homophobia and transphobia. And we're seeing the, the, the young people in particular struggling. Uh, the struggle for, you know, to protect the water, uh, the, the struggle against mining in El Salvador. Those are really strong social movements right now that, uh, you know, we need to support. But we need to know more about um, because the only because the FMLN is no longer in power and only because the FMLN uh, in general doesn't represent what it used to. I don't want people to think the movement's dead in El Salvador. Uh, on the contrary, the movement is still alive and it's still very strong. The student movements at the universities and the high schools they're still organizing. Um, so I, I, I wanted to say that because I, it's it's not all bad. Um, they're still organizing today and their movement is is hopefully the young the youngsters that are out in the streets today organizing and, and, and protesting and all that. We hope that they will be able to be the next generation that can lead uh, the revolution into a positive way. You know, revolution isn't a, a one day or a one year, or even a 10 year thing. It's a process, it's a continual process, and that's why we hope that the, the new generation takes over. So when we talk about Salvadoran socialism, I think one of the important points in the contemporary is to talk about part of the diaspora means that the, the compas who moved all over the world, uh, they've had an influence politically in different places as well. And I think I want to speak a little bit about, you know, uh, here in Los Angeles, obviously we know that the bulk of the, uh, the forced migration because of the war and U.S. imperialism in our country, a bulk of that came to Los Angeles. And I think that when Salvadorans came here, they had almost an immediate impact politically in, in different uh, specters of the struggle. You know, one of them in particular is going to be like in the movement for the justice for janitors and the different unions in L.A., where, you know, a lot of times here, you know, historically it's been like Chicanos uh, or, or different groups here in, in the L.A. area. And when Salvadorans came in, with those ideas that they brought from the struggle in El Salvador, it really made the movements here a lot more militant. And you see in like the justice for gender struggle that, that, that was, you know, it's got a lot of attention over the years where you had the Salvadoreños and Salvadoreñas who joined the movements here and different organizations here who are going to have an impact. Um, you know, even like at the student level in Mecha, I remember when I used to be in Mecha, I was the chair of Mecha at San Diego State. I know several other Salvadorans who became chairs of Mecha, even though Mecha is traditionally a Chicano and Chicana space, Salvadorans came in and brought in their um, their political analysis and made a lot of the Mecha groups and other political groups a little bit further to the left. Um, and I think that's important. And, and it's important because it shows that uh, the influence of Salv Salvadoran socialism didn't just affect El Salvador, but it went uh, beyond that as well. And um, you know, and, and I think it goes both ways. You know, the Salvadoran struggle got a lot of solidarity from people on the left in the United States and many other places around the world. And, and since then, I think we're doing our small part to contribute to the movement uh, wherever it is that we are uh, living, whether that's, and when I've, I've, I've gone to FMLN, uh, you know, events in El Salvador, where it's a trip, man. When we talk about diaspora, it is a true diaspora. Uh, you meet Salvadorans who come back from the Netherlands, from Italy, from Spain, from Australia, from uh, Switzerland, from everywhere. And it's a trip that, you know, our people are all over the world today because of the diaspora. But in, in many of those places, we're continuing to fight and we're continuing to fight for socialism. And some of us that are, you know, we weren't of that generation of the war because we were too young. Um, you know, we're continuing that today. And I think today, that's how, that's the historical legacy of that struggle that we continue that fight. We, we, we you know, we carry that, that baton of a revolutionary struggle, no matter where we are in the world. Ron, thank you so much, man. It was such a great pleasure to talk with you. And I hope for everybody who's watching and listening that they learned a little bit about Salvadoran socialism, the history of revolutionary activity in El Salvador. It's something that as Latin American communists, we have to study, we have to learn from and apply to the 21st century with modern day conditions. And we just spoke with Ron, who is a high school teacher in South Central LA, a leading member of Union del Barrio. Please make sure to follow Union del Barrio on social media. Uh, how, how do we follow Union del Barrio, Ron? Uh, what's the, the tag? Yeah, um, Twitter, Instagram, or uh, on Facebook, it's at Union del Barrio, so or, just, or the website, uniondelbarrio.org. Cool. All right, Ron, thanks so much, and I hope to talk to you soon. Take care. Hi, brother. Thank you. Thank you for having me.